I really want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. This is the first in a lecture series that Battleship New Jersey and Independence Seaport Museum, who uh, operate the submarine Bakuna and the cruiser Olympia, have partnered in. We're going to be doing these every month, usually the third Saturday of the month, depending on when our, we have speaker availabilities. Uh, we've got a whole lineup of speakers. Go ahead and check our website to see more about that. Uh, but we hope to see you in the future. Uh, we're going to be alternating every month, whether it's hosted over at ISM on Olympia or over here on New Jersey. So keep an eye out for that in the future. Uh, and of course, you know who our main speaker is tonight. Uh, I don't think I need much of an introduction there. Uh, we had advertised that Trent Hone was going to be here. Uh, he unfortunately is sick and was unable to come. We're trying to book him for a future date. Uh, we had also uh, indicated that Dr. Scholes from uh, up at the cruiser Salem was going to be here to talk about fire control. He also came down sick. Tis the season. Uh, again, we're, we're going to try and get him here in the future. Uh, so you're just stuck with his dulcet tones tonight. <laughs> uh, you guys should all have a note card. If you can think of any questions that you would like he or I or anyone else assembled here to answer, uh, feel free to write them down. We almost certainly won't have time for all of them, uh, but we'll collect them and go through and, and see which ones are uh, good and uh, go through what we can. Otherwise, we're here for about 90 minutes before the overnight program kicks us out. There's 150 Cub Scouts on board right now. And, and we do not want to be between them and the soft pretzels. <laughs> right, hello everyone. Um, I will try and limit this to about half an hour. So I'm gonna, if you see me periodically checking my phone, that's me just trying to work out what the time is. Um, so for the first half hour, I know a I recognize a bunch of you were around earlier today um, at the various Q&A sessions, and I did promise that one of them I was going to explain a little bit more about some advances in the work I've been doing on the destruction of HMS Hood. So I'm going to do that whilst also scribbling away like a madman on the whiteboard. Um, before I start, hands up anybody who's navigated a large ship. Thank goodness, right. So I'm hoping <laughs> that some of you will be nodding along and not thinking I'm a complete crazy man, uh, at least any more than normal. Um, so uh, as long as everyone's happy, I will, I will begin. Um, so obviously, as we know, HMS Hood destroyed at the Battle of Denmark Strait by Bismarck. Most of you have probably seen the video I did uh, explaining how the mechanism of how I think that worked. Um, but since I did that video in consultation with a number of other people, including various navigational officers and trainers from the Royal Navy and US Navy, I've actually been working further on the circumstances and the timings. And as I mentioned earlier today, I think I've pretty much actually got it down to within a five to 10 second window of when Hood was destroyed and a very specific situation. So the first thing I'm going to briefly try and talk about is the evidence. So we have both a lot of evidence and not enough evidence for how Hood exploded. Obviously, the slight problem that the magazines exploded means that any physical evidence of what happened has blown into a billion pieces across the uh, Atlantic Ocean floor. But we do have a fair number of statements, observations, etc., from the actual action itself. We, of course, have the three survivors who were aboard Hood, of which the most uh, useful was the account of Ted Briggs, who was on the bridge. Um, we also have observations from an orchestra, apparently. Um, and uh, we have observations from uh, Bismarck and Prince Eugen. They're of somewhat limited utility because they were miles away. Um, we do have quite a number of people who were on Prince of Wales who saw what happened. So. Working off of all of that, plus various things that were calculated, asked about expert witnesses, etc., at the two Admiralty inquiries that took place afterwards, I've been able to put together a few. A, 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 there's, as I say, a lot of evidence that's come about. Plus, of course, we have the wreck itself. Whilst a good chunk of it was blown to pieces, we do have some key parts of the wreck which form a critical body of evidence. And the main one is the rudder because one of the big questions prior to going down and examining Hood's wreck was what was Hood doing at the time she was blown up? Was she turning? Was she going in a straight line? Was she partway through a turn? What, what was going on? And when 
they went down and had a look at the wreck, they found that her rudder, or rudders, I can't remember offhand how many she had, were actually turned to port, which on the surface of it would seem to indicate that she was in the middle of her turn when she exploded. However, this is where <laughs> sea handling comes in. So for those of you who aren't aware, Hood's course at the time kind of looked like this, and then it was going, supposed to be going this 20 degree turn to port to unmask X and Y turrets so she could fully engage Bismarck and Prince Eugen. Prince of Wales, of course, was following her. So uh, the first bit of evidence that, I mean, there's a, there's a lot, but basically what we have is we have three zones. So I'm going to call zone one, zone two, zone three. So we have evidence that fits zone one. So this is e evidence that would indicate that uh, Hood was undertaking a behavior or had not yet undertaken a certain behavior. So that means that that evidence can only come from this first zone while she's going in a straight line. We have other evidence that indicates that perhaps she was in the middle of a turn. So that would be evidence to, that goes in zone two. And the thing is, there's an awful lot of evidence for both one and two. So you can't really discount either of those. And unfortunately, in some discussions which you see online and so forth, some people just go, well, I'm going to ignore all of this evidence because I want Hood to be going in a straight line. And other people say, I'm going to ignore all of this evidence because I want Hood to be in a turn because it fits their preconceived notion of how Hood was destroyed. But then you have zone three, and this is the zone where I think Hood was destroyed in, and this is the only zone, as far as I can tell, which accounts for both parts of the evidence. Now, the first thing is ships turning. So most people, you know, a big ship goes into a turn, it leans out in its turn. Um, so in this case, if it's turning to port, it's going to heel to starboard. Now, that would initially appear to be a problem for my theory, because if she's got an exposed uh, part of her side through a trough because of the wave action, if she heals to starboard, that's going to cover over that weakness. But um, if you have a long ship with a fairly fine length to beam ratio, like Hood being a battle cruiser, 45-ish thousand tons, with quite a lot of inertia, and she's going forward, and you put the rudder over to port, most people would think, especially if you're on a speedboat or something, if you've done a speedboat or something, you put the motor over to port, the rudder over to port, you turn to port. It's not how it works with big ships. There's all this inertia going forwards, and no matter how big your rudder is, that's a relatively small amount of water that's being directed to one side. So if you look in various manuals of seamanship, um, as I say, I've got copies of both the US and um, British navies, when they show you things like the radius of action, you don't have, here's where we start to turn and the ship's doing this. You have, here's where you put the, the rudder over and then you have an indeterminate point of basically going in a straight line and then the ship starts to do this. So that's your basics. However, as it turns out, it's actually a little bit more complex than that. The actual course has a very slight S-curve to it that actually goes in the opposite direction first. And when you think about it, this is actually f fairly logical because if you have your extremely crude ship, <laughs> um, so you have a rudder, you have your center of gravity, so let's say you put your rudder over to port. So you're now directing a stream of water this way. Basic physics, every, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. You now have a force equal to the force that you're kicking out that way, pushing against the rudder and therefore pushing against the ship. That's going to act as a turning moment around the center of gravity. So what actually happens, although the ship is turning to port, and in theory at that point, um, as we said, should be leaning out, so going this way, what actually happens is before the ship gets into its turn, when it's in this zone here, is it is at this lower portion of the hull is forced this way, which means this portion goes this way because it's rotating about its center of gravity. So for the a few seconds before it actually starts its full turn, the ship's actually leaning into the turn, which would actually mean that if you have an exposed starboard side in a wave trough, that's actually going to be even more exposed for a few seconds. 
before it straightens up and goes back on its route. So get rid of all of that. <laughs> um, and all of that. Right. So that's some you know, sl the slightly more complex side of uh, handling a ship. The, now, why I think Hood's destruction fits into this window now comes up in terms of signaling. So, again, for those of you who are aware of flag signaling um, in the Navy, you hoist a flag signal. That is the intent of, you know, I want you to do this. You haul down that signal. That means it's time to execute the order. Hood was flying the signal flag to blue, which means turn 20 degrees to port. So she was saying to Prince of Wales, right, we are going to proceed 20 degrees to port. We know that she was flying this using standard signal flag, standard recognition, standard pattern of orders, because Prince of Wales' deck log reveals that they'd already made two of these turns earlier, and it follows, the st and the deck log records, hood signals two blue, hood signals execute two blue. So they're not using any kind of fancy um, special way of signaling or anything. They are just using the standard signal goes up, signal goes down. Prince of Wales records that Hood is still flying to blue at the time she explodes, which means she hasn't told Prince of Wales to execute the order. This lends us in a bit of a paradox because we know from the wreck that the rudder is over. So Hood has tried to begin to turn, but she hasn't signaled. Now that's a BT level screw up if she's gone part way through a turn without telling Prince of Wales to follow. In fact, that is exactly what BT did wrong when it came to 5th Battle Squadron at Jutland. Admiral Holland is not BT. He's actually a pretty competent officer. So this is where um, Ted Briggs, who I mentioned earlier, this is where his testimony comes in. Because Ted Briggs mentions specifically a number of things in one of his longer interviews. So he mentions that he's on, he's on the bridge, Admiral Holland's there, Admiral Holland give, verbally gives the order to execute the turn. At this stage, when Holland previously has been saying, okay, signal two blue, Ted Briggs also makes a point that he sees two blue go up. And he remarks, because bear, bear in mind earlier um, Hood was hit on the boat deck, he makes a remark, oh, there's people still alive on the flag deck. This is good. Um, so we know that the flag crew were still alive at this point, and there's no further hits that are sustained until Hood explodes. So there's no reason to suspect that they, anything happens to them. So we've got two blue flying. Holland says execute. Helmsman puts the wheel over. The hit occurs. Helmsman reports steering's gone, sir. And of course, if you've already put the wheel over and straightened it up, I, you're, you're in, well into the turn or you've completed the turn, you're not going to be able to report immediately that the steering's gone because you're not going to feel anything. Whereas if you're in the process of putting the wheel over and suddenly it goes dead, you're going to be, oh, the steering's gone. So that seems to indicate that the wheel was in the process of going over at the time that uh, Hood was hit. The further thing is, of course, if you've been up to New Jersey's bridge today, you, you know where the bridge is, you know where the bridge wing is, you know where the signal halyards are. So Holland being on the bridge and saying, it's time, right, execute the order, that doesn't mean the guys on the flag halyards can hear it. So you would have to have someone on the bridge wing who would relay the order, yell down to the guys on the flag halyards, who would then haul down two blue. So when you combine that with the timing of what Ted Briggs has said, it puts this very narrow window of Holland has said execute, the helmsman who's right there is like, all right, okay, immediately go putting the wheel over to port. Now we have an explanation for why the rudder is over to port. However, the hit arrives whilst the helmsman can still feel the response of the ship while he's turning the wheel, reporting the steering's gone, which would then coincide with the order not having reached the flag deck for them to haul the two blue down before everything goes pear-shaped and the, and the uh, ship explodes. And if it's that early i.e. the wheel is still going over or has only just been locked over, then that would explain why Hood was still doing this basically near enough straight line element, maybe actually tilted a little bit more to port um, before the, so she hasn't actually begun her turn when she explodes. And this 
this whole time period, as those of you who have navigated a large ships will know, is depending on your speed, mass, length to breadth ratio is going to be three, five, ten seconds. Um, obviously, with hood and with the specific sea conditions, it could be somewhere in, in between that, but probably around about five seconds, which would then make it that would be the only time that hood could have been hit, because if she was hit any earlier, her wheel wouldn't have been over, the rudder wouldn't have been over. If she was hit any later, two blue would have been hauled down. Um, and that's basically the, the, the quick version, the cliff note summary of uh, the further work I've, uh, I've been doing into it. There's a, there are a few other bits and pieces um, that are involved, like I said, with the, um, with, with, um, the ship canting over. The, uh, but the other thing which is really interesting, which is something I've only come across in the past month or two, is that obviously Hood is a British designed battle cruiser. Um, there is footage of Hood, because obviously you can take pictures and you can show pictures, but pictures can be snapshots. They, you know, all sorts of circumstances can lead to a picture. There is footage of Hood traveling at speed. There's also footage of, Rena of not Renown, Repulse traveling at speed. Um, and Repulse, although she's not the same hull form as Hood, she's a very similar hull form. And in both cases, and this is a, a rather critical thing, it, the Admiralty Inquiry Court in after the destruction of Hood, they actually looked at the possibility of the wave, uh, wave crest and trough, and they ran the calculations and they said, well, yeah, it exists, but it's not going to be deep enough to cause a problem at this speed. More recently, um, computer calculations have been done using the programs that they use to simulate the performance of ship's hulls. And that shows pretty much what the Admiralty Court calculated, that yes, there would be a trough, but it's not really enough to make much of a difference to Hood's protection. However, when you look at the footage of Repulse and the footage of Hood, as well as some of the pictures of Hood, and some of the pictures from various other British design battlecruisers, mostly the Congos, you can see on all of them this trough is present and it's considerably larger than just the calculations show, at which point we have the physical evidence in reality that actually shows that this is a much bigger problem than the calculations would seem to suggest. Now, quite why there's this difference between the reality and the calculations, I don't know. Um, whether there was some kind of alteration to Hood's um, hull or her trim or something like that during a refit and the lines that they were using were maybe therefore a little bit out of date. I, I don't know, and I won't be able to tell without a lot of further work. But for the purposes of this theory, it actually doesn't really matter. What matters is what, what the actual crest and trough formation was, and we have the footage to prove that it was quite, quite considerably deep. So that is, as I say, pretty much uh, uh, the the evidence for how Hood was destroyed and when exactly Hood was destroyed, with the only other caveat that I put in is that Hood would therefore be unique in the world of capital ships in that she's pretty much the only capital ship to have this vulnerability. Um, not because she's the only one with a crest and trough, but because you've basically got two eras of capital ship design, World War I-ish, which Hood belongs to, and World War II. In World War I, most capital ships are 21 knotters. You've got the occasional 23, 25 knotter, but you know, it's, it's sub 25 knots. So obviously if you're moving through the water at a slower speed, your bow wave is going to be less, your trough is going to be less. You then have the faster ships, especially the Congos, the Renowns, and Hood. However, if, you're if you have seen the video, you might recall, Hood's belt armor, 12 inches angled, was enough at that range to resist Bismarck's 15-inch shells. For Renown, Congo, and their sisters, that doesn't matter. They only had eight or nine inches of belt armor. Bismarck shell would have gone through that belt anyway. Hood's the only one who's got this weak, this um, sort of belt that can resist the shell, but also this accompanying weakness. Now, you skip forward to World War II, and you've got ships like New Jersey, which can match or exceed Hood's speed, so theoretically should have the same problem. But by the time you get to World War II ship designs, the belt armor has become considerably deeper because they're having to worry about diving shells, reinforcement to torpedo defenses, depending on the ship design, etc. So, e And obviously the fact the whole form is slightly different. But even if New Jersey proceeding at speed 
had exactly the same depth of trough buildup, her belt armor runs deep enough that uh, a shell dropping into that would still impact the lower edges of the belt armor, and it, the belt armor would hopefully do its job. Which, you know, the, it, it means Hood is, as I said, the only one that's well armored enough for this to actually be a proper weakness, fast enough to create the problem, and old enough that she doesn't have a, a deep belt. Um, so with that, I think, time-wise, that's 25 out of my 30 minutes. <laughs> so um, does anyone, any, anyone, especially those of you who have navigated large ships before, have any uh, quick comments or su suggestions, bits of evidence they think I might have missed? The only thing I could think of is um, prop lock. So if it's a right-handed versus left-handed weapon, uh, left propeller, it's Mm -hmm. motion. That's why a turning circle going to starboard port mm -hmm. will be wider one way versus the other mm -hmm. on a ship. You can see it on a tug and barge, you can even see it on his anchor. With a ship that big going that fast, <coughs> it's designed to go fast, I wonder if it would be even more extreme if it's turning one way versus the other. Mm -hmm. kind of color it that's, that's a fair point. Um, I suppose it's good. that would have that would require some further research to see what kind of effect that would have. Um, but yeah, but thank you for pointing that out. How many screws does Hood have? Four. It, do they count? I don't know off the top of my head. If they do, hmm. One side will still overpower another just a little bit, so hmm. that you'd still have a wider turning radius hmm. to port or start from one way or the other. Hmm. Um, have you been able? Um, I, I haven't been able to find the actual calculations and workings um, in the report I retrieved from Q, which was one of the two Admiralty inquiries. Um, it's basically presented as one of the people who's giving evidence says, we have gone and calculated this and what's entered into evidence at the inquiry is charts and diagrams, which are the results of the calculations. Um, particularly, uh, the sort of the centerpiece of that is this wave trough diagram that they have along the profile of Hood, and then some course diagrams. Uh, but the actual underlying work that has informed that is not in that document. Whether it's in some other document that I don't know about, I don't. I, obviously, I don't know. But they, they've just kind of they've shown the answer and not the working, if you like. Because operating, you know, larger ships, at its speeds. Helmsman will tend to oversteer at first. So if it's mm. left uh, um, 20 degrees, mm. the, they'll put the rudder over more to a 45 yeah. mm. to, to a help a kick it, and then ease their off as. Yeah, because yeah, of course the course correction is we want to change course by 20 degrees. That doesn't strictly mean the rudder has to go over 20 degrees. So this is, this is the other thing. Um, the sea state that occurs during the battle, um, as far as I can tell from the available logs, we don't have any specific evidence at that moment of what the sea state is. Um, we do have some footage from Prince Eugen but as most of you will know, you know, Prince Eugen and Bismarck are miles away. The sea state there is not necessarily reflective of the sea state over at Prince of Wales and Hood. Um, we do have indications in the log of what the sea state was immediately before the battle and immediately after the battle. And there's no particular, and we've obviously got that final photo of, slightly blurry photo of Hood proceeding into action, which reflects the two statements in the log. So we have no particular reason to suspect the sea state magically went calmer or particularly rougher than those, those two bookends. Um, and obviously there would be wave, natural wave interaction with the bow wave and trough, which would change things on a, on a second by second basis, but not by a tremendous amount as far as I can tell uh, from, from my own work, maybe by a, a, a foot or two in terms of the, the static standing wave. Um, 
but that's again that that's my calculations based on my hydrodynamics work I did at university because <laughs> um, I don't have access to the multi-million <laughs> dollar uh, computer programs that the uh, guys in the Netherlands did, who ran the uh, their, their own calculations do. Um, so, uh, if, is, if there's anyone else who wants to, do you think the Lexingtons as built as battlecruisers? Lexington almost certainly would have, but Lexington would have fallen into the same gap as the Congos and the Renowns of its belt armor is thin enough. It doesn't really make much odds the shell could go through the belt armor as well. Um, the thing is that, as again, as those of you who've sailed in large ships would not, will, will already know, the bow wave and trough is not a phenomenon that's unique to fast ships. Um, it depends somewhat on the whole form of the ship itself, but it is present on pretty much any ship once you get above a handful of knots. Uh, and in fact, what, as I was mentioning earlier today, there is a rather wonderful photo of USS Iowa BB-4, the pre-dreadnought, where she's proceeding over basically mill pond seas. And you can see with, there's a quite a considerable bow wave and quite a considerable trough. And actually, because she's not going particularly quickly, there's another crest and another trough before you run out of hull. Um, so it's just, it's just a standard element of, of physics. Are there like any pertinent data that could be taken from the logs of, I think, Norfolk and Suffolk who were in trailing? Hmm. Unfor action? Unfortunately, they're even further away from Hood and Prince of Wales than Bismarck and Prince Eugen are. Right, but, you know, um, she stayed prevailing wind. Um, they would obviously <sighs> come over across it. Think, uh, I think Suffolk, I think, stopped for a wreckage of Hood. Uh, Prince of Wales dodged around. Um, the problem is you've basically got Hood and Prince of Wales, Bismarck and Prince Eugen, and Norfolk and Suffolk. Yeah. So Norfolk and Suffolk kind of roughly confirm what Pr Bismarck and Prince Eugen experienced. Of course, all of Bismarck's logs are gone as well. Um, so basically, we know from Prince Eugen what the Germans were experiencing. Norfolk and Suffolk were roughly speaking in their tale, so they were kind of confirming what they were experiencing. Hood and Prince of Wales, again, it's, it, it all builds up to a fairly consistent picture. There's no particular reason to doubt the sea state because everybody's experiencing roughly the same thing before, during, and after. It's just we, we can't absolutely 100% definitively say that there wasn't, for some reason, this localized pocket of increased or decreased sea state around Prince of Wales and Hood at the time because no one bothered to record it. Um, but, you know, law of averages, that's probably what happened. Um, so, in that case, uh, that's my half hour-ish on Hood done. Um, that's, that's kind of my pricey version of hopefully what I hopefully will be presenting at the Macmullen um, conference in September, assuming they accept the paper. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And obviously at that point I'll have like video and pictures and PowerPoints <laughs> and slides and everything, but uh, we kind of put this together at the last minute because we were expecting to listen to Trent Ho and talk about Admiral Nimitz for this half hour, and instead you got stuck with me. Um, right, so um, what are we going to do next? Are we going to do questions? Yes. Pertinent to your talk, you had a very good uh, presentation you know, in your, your podcast about this whole effort. Are you saying or suggesting that um, I don't think I've got to amend it because the method of the destruction, I think, is correct. What this is basically doing is taking that a step further and instead of saying this is the only viable logical explanation for why Hood was destroyed, this is now saying this, I think, the, the logical explanation for why Hood was destroyed and here is why it took place in this particular time gap. At the time that I did my video, it was kind of maybe a five minute window um, where the circumstances were correct for this to occur, whereas the work I've done since has been partly to triple to confirm that the wave trough element definitely existed by analyzing pictures and video footage of the ships and related ships, and then using the evidence to more narrowly track down exactly where this time bracket that actually fits all the evidence should be because as you may recall from the original video my approach was basically this is what the collective body of evidence says if something that's proposed falls outside that major body of evidence then it can't it can't be right you know there's, there's no pet theories here <laughs> um, 
although at the same time I also have to say, as I said in the video at the time, I worked very closely with Bill Durans on rounding out the, uh, the, that initial theory because he's done a lot of work on that as well. Um, which made me quite happy because, you know, if, if for those of you who've heard of Bill Durans, hopefully most of you have, he's a very respected naval historian. So if I've come to the same conclusion as him independently and we both agree, it's like, well, at least someone else agrees with me. <laughs> Who knows what they're talking about? Real quick, um, once you go through the whole process with that paper, will hmm? that be like available? Like, to, 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 to yes, once, once the paper, if, if McMullen accept yes. the paper, then it will obviously be published as part of their... Uh, notes and at that point I probably will do a follow-up um, video to, which is basically going to be clarifying clarifying this um, right so are we on to our written questions or 30 seconds okay 30 second question anyone <laughs> Do you need a ah now that's an interesting question is it possible there were multiple hits Theoretically, yes. It's very unlikely, give, uh, given Bismarck was firing four gun salvos. Uh, now, admittedly, not at, people weren't splash counting. Well, probably someone on Bismarck was, but for obvious reasons, they weren't around <laughs> shortly thereafter to say. Um, it is theoretically possible that there were multiple hits on Hood, but it seems relatively unlikely um, because from... The evidence that we have from the survivors and from Prince of Wales, uh, Prince of Wales, for example, Captain Leach says he, he formed the impression that something singular had arrived aboard Hood. Um, and uh, Ted Briggs' testimony seems to indicate that there was an impact that shook the ship and steering's gone, sir. Um, the other two who were more general crew report they felt something hit the ship. They're, so everyone who, who felt it or observed it seems to talk about it in the singular. Um, in theory, I suppose it's possible you might have two very closely spaced hits from a pair of shells coming in. Um, that would be spectacularly unlucky, albeit, to be fair, the whole thing was spectacularly <laughs> unlucky, so who knows. Um, but the thing is that a, a, a double shell hit doesn't really add all that much to the equation. Mm. Well, the, the loss of steering would probably be explained by the fact the four-inch magazine has just blowtorched its way through the mid, mid part of the ship and therefore has probably completely vaporized the steering cables as well. Um, because what, obviously when the helmsman says steering's gone, what he means is the bridge steering is not responding, which, you know, if you have, what was it, something like 50 tons of four-inch ammunition going up, yeah, that that's gonna that's gonna deal a bit of a death blow to your ability to steer from up front. Yeah, one of the things I was wondering, mm -hmm. you mentioned Hook still had the two blue signal bombs. Yeah. Did would the Admiral want the, the Prince of Wales to I say at least in the navy mm -hmm. marching drills instead of a <coughs> uh, left flank turn mm -hmm. where both ships turn mm -hmm. simultaneously, might have he wanted it to be a column where after I complete my turn, when you get to my where I was, then you make your turn. Well, so that you're maintaining a similar range. That would that w that is actually the default that everyone follows. This is this is why you had the problem at Jutland, because um, when you're following the leader under normal signal conditions, you're supposed to follow their their course. So two blue being hauled down would basically be okay. We're turning twenty degrees to port, and Prince of Wales is supposed to follow in Hood's wake. Um, okay. And it's not, it's not this. no, that would be a simultaneous turn, which has its own separate signal, okay. uh, because effectively that's a 20 degree to port version of the battle turn away that the high seas fleet does, which is basically it's exactly the same thing. Everyone turns simultaneously, except they do a 180 instead of 20. Right. Um, so that would have been a different signal because, yeah, Holland, as far as anyone can tell, was trying to keep them both in line. Right. Ryan's coming in with the chair. <laughs> so Drac got to talk for a half hour about his uh, most recent research. I'm going to talk for not a half hour uh, about some of the research we're recently doing and a video that will hopefully go up in the near future. We're, we're working with a different company uh, to put this video out, so it's, it's still going through the review process. You guys are sitting on tanker chairs, by and large, not the white plastic folding ones, but these wardroom chairs. They're made out of steel, and if you try to pick them up, they're damned heavy. 
This seven pound chair is known as a battleship chair. And I only recently found that out. Uh, and you guys have seen these all over the place, right? Uh, my elementary school had these chairs. Uh, all sorts of government buildings, institutions, hospitals have these chairs. Iowa class battleships are designed to have 395 chairs during World War II. Things like wardroom chairs, officer staterooms, uh, radio rooms, radar rooms, things like that. Uh, so there's just a ton of these chairs. So you multiply that by the number of ships that the United States Navy is making, and they need a bunch of chairs. Uh, so, so these steel chairs that you guys are sitting in that are, that are practically armor plate uh, could go into the construction of new ships. Also, our World War II era ships are treaty limited. Even the ones that aren't treaty limited, we're slapping anti-aircraft guns on them. We're putting extra top weight on in the form of radars and things like that. Uh, so you're adding weight, you're adding weight, you're adding weight. They're, they're having all sorts of stability problems. They have to subtract that weight from somewhere. So in 1944, the Navy puts out a design competition for a new type of chair. <laughs> And that's where the battleship chair comes in. This particular chair that you guys have seen all over the place um, won the design competition because the designer threw it out of an eight-story window. <laughs> this battleship is designed to last for about 20 years before it becomes obsolete. Uh, in actuality, with frequent refits, the Navy got about 50 years out of this ship. Uh, and we're celebrating her 80th anniversary this year. So we're, we're really getting some mileage out of this ship beyond what the Navy wanted. This stupid chair is designed to last 150 years. <laughs> the, this chair outlasts the battleship. In fact, more than three quarters of the battleship's original chairs are gone. Because when the ship was decommissioned, the Navy took all of the ones that were accessible and put them on new ships and kept using them. Uh, this particular chair, if you were going to buy it today, uh, costs $1,350. Right? Uh, it takes more than two weeks to manufacture this chair. It's 77 individual steps. Um, you, you've heard that joke about the government paying $1,000 for a hammer? Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, the, the hammer though, is going to outlive the life of everything that it constructs. Uh, so that's why the, the government's paying all that money for these chairs. The key to this is that steel chair that you're sitting on will get rusty. We're, we're in a salt water environment. After every meal, the mess cooks come out with salt water and mop the decks in here. So those chairs start to corrode over time. The aluminum doesn't. The one problem with aluminum is uh, around 850 degrees, it'll burn. So, so most bad fires you have on a ship would cause that to burn. Uh, we went to the factory that makes these chairs because it's only two hours away in Hanover, Pennsylvania. They've been making these chairs since 1944. Uh, they've made over a million of them now. Uh, which means that there's still a million of them in circulation because they're only 80 years old. They still have half of their lives ahead of them, which, terrible business model. <laughs> like, no, seriously. In the 70s, the company almost went out of business because nobody needed new chairs. The, the Navy had all of them that they needed. Uh, but they were able to find new, new venues. That they now sell them a lot to restaurants and things like that. Um, but the, the key to making this aluminum as strong as steel so you can throw it out of an eight-story window and have it survive, uh, they have a multi-step process. But the cool part that we have footage of that we're going to put out hopefully this week, maybe next week, whenever we've gotten final approval from the company. Uh, they dunk this chair in liquid salt. That, that's not salt water. They heat the salt to 1,000 degrees so that it turns into a clear liquid. And then they dunk the chair in it. Like the guy's wearing the full aluminum <coughs> space suit when he does it, wearing the big gloves and everything. And then they pull it out and do, do a number of other things. Uh, bathe it in quench or whatever else, and, and bake it. And that heat treatment process makes this as strong as steel, but not as heavy. It, it stays the same weight as aluminum. So uh, that is what I've been researching this past week that really gets me excited. <laughs>
Uh, so we, we've gotten a little bit down in the weeds about what's uh, outfitting the, the battleship these days. Yes. Uh, oh, and the, the company that makes these chairs is uh, called Emico, by the way. Uh, and, and they're, uh, they're, they're uh, helping with the, the museum out. None yet. We're still working with them on that. If you'd like to donate a chair, please come talk to me. Yeah. Because no, we, we've been talking with them about how we should have X number of chairs, and we're significantly short. We've got under 100 of the nearly 400 that we were built with. Uh, any chair-related questions? <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, so does that mean that if they have that long of a lifespan, does that mean the chairs are, that were manufactured in like the 40s and 50s are have moved from like they are on their like fourth or fifth ship now because they keep getting? Because I feel like at some point you guys would be able to get some surplus. Uh, I have a strong suspicion that many of these chairs have just rotated from ship to ship. When we've gone to the Philadelphia Navy Yard to strip parts. Most of the chairs are gone from those ships, um, but we have managed to strip a couple back to, to outfit these. Usually they're in deep, dark places, and the sailors were, were too lazy to do it. Or the yard birds hid them away, so they had somewhere to hang out when they're supposed to be doing ship inspections. Oh, yeah. Yes? Do the chairs have serial numbers? Can you track individual chairs? <laughs> 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 that sounds very government-like. Why not? Uh, <laughs> as far as I know, do they, they do not. Uh, current day Emico chairs are stamped. Uh, the chairs on this ship seem to have had paper tags, and most of those tags do not, in fact, have a 150-year lifespan or an 80-year old lifespan. So we don't have many of those left. This particular chair, yeah, it, it's got no distinguishing markings besides being that type of chair that we all know and have seen somewhere before. Uh, some people call them battleship chairs. Some people call them institutional chairs. Yeah. I like battleship chairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I noticed that the one that you grabbed doesn't have a clip on the bottom like, to secure it for C. So were the original ones up on the ship, did they come with that clip so they could secure it for C, or did they have another way to do it? <laughs> uh, the, the blueprints for the original ones that won the competition, which are hanging on the wall in the Emico factory, does have like an eye bolt on the bottom to tie them down. Uh, it seems like that goes away pretty quick. It, it's the 78th step, and it moves you into the third week of production. <laughs> so they just tie it from the center beam to the deck. Or uh, I've also seen it where they tie from the leg to the leg of a table. <laughs> well, I mean, your tables are bolted to the deck here. Mo most of them are on the ship. Hmm? Uh, because they did aluminum work, they also made a lot of the World War II era lockers for the ship. So it seems like they, they did other contracts besides just, we need a lot of chairs for all these ships we're building. Uh, the the World War II era lockers were? I'm not entirely sure. Some of these could be uh, sheet, sheet metal. Yeah, yeah. Do we need to keep talking about the chair? I love the chair. We're saving some content for the video. <laughs> <laughs> we actually still have those chairs on board these days. Yeah? yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going to be like a, like a nice thing where it's like the Germans were struggling to build planes out of, and, and we were using aluminum to build chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just to chime, chi just to chime in on on that that particular point when it comes to ridiculous allied surpluses, um, that that reminds me of another thing which was um, during the preparations for potential German invasion of the UK with Operation Sea Lion, the Germans were desperately budgeting and rationing their fuel because even at that point they were running short on oil products. 
the British, mostly courtesy of you guys, had more oil than they knew what to do with to the point that our primary anti-tank defenses in the south of England consisted of uh, giant leaf spring catapults hidden in hedgerows with 55 gallon drums of oil on them um, on the basis that German tank comes in down hedgerow lane you fire your pre-sighted catapult you dump 55 gallons of burning hydrocarbons over the German tank it's not like a Molotov cocktail that will burn out the engine or anything. The simple logic was if you dump that much burning hydrocarbons over a tank, it'll burn up all the oxygen in the tank and the crew will suffocate. At which point you have a free tank. <laughs> We will be watching. Has anyone got any more of these little things? Just to p pass them forward, I guess. Mm -hmm. Everyone feeling like they've got their money worth so far? <laughs> Hey. Well, the, the good news for me is like none of you guys who have actually navigated big ships stood up and said, shut up, you idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. So um, I'm counting that one as a win. Yeah. Mind you, actually, speaking of ships going into high-speed turns, most of you have probably seen that footage of um, Enterprise doing a high-speed <laughs> turns where the crew are kind of walking uphill to get, get to the uh, various ships. Um, I recently came across some footage of, I think, it, it was a Nimitz class of some kind doing a high-speed turn. Um, and the particular video I saw, was it was titled, um, I Bet You Someone's Heart Was In Their Mouth. And it wasn't so much because of the turn. I mean, okay, a 100,000 ton ship that's tilting over at 30 degrees is pretty impressive. The more impressive thing was there was a, an FA-18 on deck and about halfway through the turn, you see it start to roll. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see a guy in a very high-vis high -vis set of gear chasing it down, down the slope. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's more than his pay's worth to let that go over the side. Oh God. Yeah, it was that. It was that kind of. It was that run of a desperate man who who knows it's worth more than his life to to let it happen. So, uh, fortunately, at that point, the ship starts evening out and the thing coasts to a gentle halt before going over the side. <laughs> Imagine. I mean, I, I've I've not been on any seriously large ship when it started pitching and rolling, but I have been on a, I have been on an Icelandic tug turned into a whale watching ship that fe found heavy seas off Reykjavik. Um, that was that was an interesting time because uh, they they stuck a big plastic crow's nest right at the top of the mast to watch the whales, and I'm happily set, sitting there or standing there holding on to the edge. And then absolute garbage gibberish comes over the loudspeaker, which apparently is what passes for Icelandic. Um, I, of course, have no idea what's going on or what they're saying, and everyone else disappears. I look around and say, where's everyone gone? Um, apparently, it was Icelandic for, we're about to encounter really heavy seas, everyone get below decks. They didn't think to repeat the order in English. So by the time I'm looking around, as the now sole occupant of the crow's nest happens to coincide just when we start hitting seas, and anyone who's seen a tugboat in heavy seas knows they are not exactly the world's most stable craft. So I was then subjected to the next 15 minutes of, oh, look, it's the sea. Oh, look, it's the sky. Oh, look, it's the sea. Oh, look, it's the sky. Um, complete with, at one point, me just hanging on to the side, almost as if it was, you know, as if I was hanging on to a ceiling and just going, well, if I fall off or let go, I'm basically going to be catapulted like a trebuchet shot into the North Atlantic. So I guess I'm holding on. Maybe that was their way of returning you home. 
I did po quite possibly. Um, I mean, the, the, to be honest, the single funniest part of the experience was when the seas calmed down. I think as we came, we went back into harbour, and I was, I, I thought it was now safe enough to climb down the ladder. Went back inside. You've never seen crewmen go white fast so so fast, <laughs> <laughs> because they're all like shepherding about fifty seasick tourists um, and Icelandic people. And then I just rock up and open the door. I was like, "Hello." <laughs> uh, they're just like, we left one out there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at one point I saw a puffin go past at eye level. Uh, I'm not sure who was more confused. <laughs> um, the weird thing was I didn't get seasick. Everyone else down there did, so I think I actually got the better end of the deal because I got a free roller coaster ride, and I didn't get coated in vomit. My two younger brothers did. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th th someone's given me this he, the question for Drake. He says, "Eagles or Chiefs? Who do you want to win?" Um, well, since since I desire to leave this ship alive, um, and someone did give me a rather fetching scarf earlier today, I'm going to go with Eagles. <laughs> uh, and uh, as far as will you watch the game? Well, apparently it's kicking off at six tomorrow, which means that I'll be in the. Um, uh, or wherever the heck that pub is called that I've forgotten about in DC that I said I'd be at. <laughs> in theory, I'm going to be uh, they're in there at six, so assuming they have it on the screens. Yeah. And we're going to have, I think it's going to be quite fun, a bunch of people piled into an English themed pub watching a Super Bowl <laughs> whilst trying, presumably, to eat. Um, mm, yeah. And everyone being very confused as to what kind of football. <laughs> yes. Um, right. Do we have uh, questions? There's a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, there is the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> this is for Drake. I'm genuinely curious, why do we look so hard into ultimately unknowable questions like, was Bismarck scuttled? Or, <laughs> what really was a battle cruiser? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think part of it, to be honest, is uh, people on the internet like to be right. Um, and some people on the internet just like to tell everyone else that they're wrong. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think, I think there's two separate ones. I think with the what really it was a battle cruiser is we do have an insatiable desire to try and pigeonhole things and classify things, and generically we think of the capital ships of World One, World War Two. You're, they're either a battleship or a battle cruiser, and that's a very nice binary pair but it doesn't really work very well because you could, you could legitimately make an argument that there's about at least four, possibly five different types of battle cruiser, each of which have rather different mission profiles and capabilities, um, and a, at least two of those classifications start to stray towards the fast battleship. <laughs> but there's a certain element of people, I think, because of probably mostly Jutland and possibly secondarily Hood, there's a sort of a common perception that battle cruisers are the weak, thin-skinned versions of things, um, which isn't actually necessarily true. But, and I think that's where you get the real, the real arguments. I mean, you know, like when I did that video, are, are Hood and Iowa battleships or battle cruisers? <laughs> you know, it, it tends to set people off a little bit. With Bismarck being scuttled, to be perfectly honest, I think it's a com I think it's a combination of two things. It's a combination of admittedly allied propaganda that played the Germans up to be this like hyper threat um, in World War II, which has then just kind of continued because everyone accepted it at the time. So it's actually re weirdly wartime propaganda that is our own wartime propaganda that everyone now believes, even though it was quite blatantly propaganda at the time, um, and. I think when it comes to Bismarck, Bismarck in particular being scuttled, honestly, I think a lot of it is people sometimes just generically buying into the like German technology, German everything is better than everybody else. They don't want to believe that a German thing could lose. Uh, this is, so actually, I, had, I was talking with a couple of uh, other historians a couple of weeks ago by email, and I was having a little bit of a rant that it's very, I said, it's very interesting that practically every German ship you ever read about that ended up sinking in some way, shape, or form. Every major German ship, 
there's a very large portion of published works and people on the internet who will absolutely insist that it was scuttled and are very, very vocal about them letting you know that it was scuttled, who are nowhere near as vocal for all the other ships in similar circumstances. Because if you think about it, Yorktown, yeah, the, York, the Yorktown, glass Yorktown, Midway, most people are like, yeah, she's sunk by the Japanese. No, she was actually scuttled by the US Navy. Most of the Japanese carriers at Midway were also scuttled by the Japanese Navy. But you read, it, like most people are quite happy to say at Midway, the US sunk four Japanese carriers, the Japanese sunk one American carrier, because we kind of accept that you know, the other side did most of the damage. It was going down anyway, so any, any scuttling that was done was basically just a coup de grace. But for some bizarre reason, when it comes to German ships, people tend to adopt this weird mindset that it would have stayed afloat if the Germans hadn't deliberately sunk their own ship, at which point it's like, well, then why did they sink their own ship? <laughs> it's like, it was, if it was just going to stay afloat. Good point. I think that, that my, naval, my high school naval mm. science instructor uh, says about the scuttling of the Bismarck. Mm. The British put it in such a sorry state of existence that, the Ger that if the Germans did scuttle it, they scuttled because they had no choice. Mm. So, they sunk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. There's another one. <laughs> Were there any other lost scenarios as unlucky as Hood's, i.e. Bismarck's rudder hit or Prince of Wales' prop shaft hit? The more I read about it, I, the more I come to the conclusion that rudder and prop shaft hits are actually really common. Because <laughs> Vittoria Veneto is hit by one. Uh, it takes a actually very similar hit to Prince of Wales, but has the time to slow down, stop, seal everything up, and get going again. Um, almost all of the Japanese capital ships that are sunk by air attack at some point take rudder and prop hits, albeit, to be fair, with the Amato and Masashi, it would be more exceptional if they didn't, considering how many torpedoes they were hit with. Um, so, uh, other lost scenarios as unlucky as Hood's. Uh, the, the, the armor pier, I mean, mm, Arizona, I'm in two minds. The armor piercing bombs that the Japanese dropped on her, when they worked properly, and not all of them did, but when they worked properly, they did have the armor penetration capability to get down into the vitals of the ship. Um, I suppose, in some ways, you could probably say Roma. Because although the Fritz X is a quite a fearsome weapon, there's actually a surprising number of ships that get hit by Fritz X's and survive, albeit heavily damaged. Roma was just very unlucky in that she copped a Fritz X hit straight to the magazine, which that was that. Uh, she'd actually been hit by one earlier and survived that one, albeit crippled, same as like Warspite did. But then she takes a hit to the magazine and that's it. So Roma technically, I suppose, would count. Um, hmm? Horst's. Mm, They were pulling out of range. They were beginning to get beyond what Duke of York considered to be decent range. She, she, there was still plenty of range they could shoot at, but I, I would tend to discount Sean Horse's incredibly lucky because at that range, there were significant portions of her armor that you'd expect a 14-inch shell to penetrate. The fact that it penetrated exactly where it did and knocked out its engine was unlucky, but it's not quite hood levels of unluckiness. What about Juno, the second torpedo that hit Juno hitting inside the hole from the first torpedo? Yeah, that's, that's pretty, I mean, on the one hand, that is pretty bad. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, the mechanics of yeah, a double torpedo hit to the same location is spectacularly unlucky. I suppose the flip side with that one would be, it's not exactly the world's largest ship. I think a second torpedo hitting anywhere well, would have done it, would have sunk, sunk it, but, but not in that spectacular no, fashion. Yeah. yeah. What's our... Uh, Forum doesn't count. Another one for me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we have a video in remastered HD of the main magazine explosion of USS Arizona. Uh, what info, if any, uh, can you use from that video to better inform your research on the loss of HMS Hood? Um, unfortunately, there's not a huge amount that you can draw as parallels, uh, partly because Hood's underway and Arizona isn't, which is going to make a lot of difference to the mechanics of how the ship dies. But the other thing is that although they are both magazine explosions, the propellants involved are very different. Um, so at, for Arizona, as far as anyone can really best tell, it's a significant black powder explosion followed by a massive deflagration of the main magazines. 
and the US propellant is very different from the British propellant. It tends more to deflagrate, which is basically very intense, quick burning, rather than explode. Um, Hood uses cordite, effectively, for most of her propellant. So the, the way it burns is very different. And also, um, with Hood, as far as all the evidence seems to show, the magazines exploded and popped the ship open. Whereas with Arizona, that black powder explosion is what opened the ship up first, and then the magazines cook off, which is why you get this massive roiling fireball for a while, um, which I say is a deflagration. Whereas if the bomb had gone off in the magazines, and the magazines had cooked off, you would have had the buildup of pressure from a much larger amount of explosive, which would then have done considerably more damage to the ship. So... Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's a huge amount of parallels that we, unfortunately, that we can draw from that, um, except for the fact to know, obviously, that um, U.S. Navy propellant was slightly less likely to explode, um, which was, I mean, quite a benefit, because uh, later on you have Boise, who takes a magazine hit. <sighs> Technically, I think if she'd been a British cruiser, she probably would have been lost, because she does have a magazine fire and a magazine explosion. A cordite-filled magazine probably would have just gone bang. Um, with Boise, she kind of starts the process of exploding, but it starts as this deflagration, and then the sea comes in the hole that's been made that set the magazine on fire and puts it out. And it can sometimes be just that half second or seconds difference between just instantly going pop and building up to go pop that makes it, and obviously Boise survives. Next one's me. Mm -hmm. What are the most interesting artifacts you found that were stashed away on the ship? <laughs> uh, I, I promise not to talk about chairs anymore. <laughs> uh, th this one's pretty obvious, the, the keys that we found. Uh, so for, for those of you who haven't heard, in the maintenance office, ah. Where's the other one? Black keys in my pockets. <laughs> that was a harpoon piece. Harpoon? That was the good one. I have a lot of keys. <laughs> I found 100 pounds. <laughs> this is the nuclear permission to fire key for an Iowa class battleship. <laughs> Uh, we found a 20-pound box of keys. So that's everything for the gear reduction boxes, the other engineering stuff, uh, and the weapons department keys, including uh, harpoons, tomahawks, and a bunch that we still don't know what they are. Well, we've been going around to keyholes that we didn't even know we were there until we had keys, and we're like, okay, what do these go to? And uh, trying keys in them. And some of the keys, fortunately, like this one, have a tag on it, nuclear permission to fire. Uh, so I have no idea where these were. They may have all started out in one box in one space on the ship they, <coughs> when the ship was decommissioned, or they may have been all over the place. And early on in the museum's career, before I came along, uh, they were all put in a box and taken to the maintenance office. Well, this gets put back in a closet. And we're now three or four new maintenance directors in in the history of the ship. And finally, one of these guys goes through and is cleaning out the office and finds this box of keys. It doesn't go to any of our, our current day locks. He's like, I'm going to throw that out. No, we want to keep that one. Uh, so, so we start going through it and, and realize what we have. Uh, so th this is easily the coolest thing uh, that, that I've found on board since, uh, since working here. Uh, Yeah, yeah, but we didn't find any of that. Like, we, we knew that was there when we started. Um, yeah, that's not. I'm going to go to the second part of the question. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what are your favorite unrestored off the tour route spaces on the ship? Uh, <laughs> that, that's been restored. Uh, some of my favorite places on the ship where I make sure I take everybody who takes a tour with me uh, after steering. Uh, the 
aft uh, emergency diesel generator room. It's the only space on the ship where all four propeller shafts go through. There's also at least two good examples of sailor art down there. And unfortunately, uh, it's got one ladder in and one ladder out, and we fall under New Jersey uh, fire marshal standards. Um, so there have to be two ways in or out of a space for us to be able to open it to the public. Yeah, there, there's a couple of places where we've had to get both the Navy and the State Historic Preservation Officer's permission to cut new doors to be able to open things to the public. Uh, and I just don't see a way to cut a hole into uh, spaces, spaces like aft diesel or uh, we're working on a way to get into aft steering in the next couple of years. Uh, that, that is on our list, but it, it's a difficult one because aft steering is in its own separate armored box. We, we can't really cut through that armor plate. Um, some other favorite spaces. As, as high as I can get in the superstructure. My first tour of the ship with uh, my, my predecessor, the, the first thing I asked him was, how, how high can you take me? Uh, so, so that's a favorite. If we had an elevator that went to the top of the ship, I'd eat lunch up there every day. Uh, but since it's a 12-story hike from my office, I do not. Uh, oh, okay. Um, all the way in the bow of the ship is a space called the sand locker. It's where they stored the sand that they would put on the teak to holy stone it, to sand it. Um, but somebody climbed up on the frames of the ship all the way to the front and put a really big lipstick mark uh, right on the inside of the bow of the ship. I have no idea what the story is to that. No idea at all. Uh, I, I don't have any records of the museum painting that space. It could be museum era. Uh, but it could also go back to when the ship was in service at some point. No lipsticks were left, huh? Nope, nothing. <laughs> nothing. What a date. Are lips like fingerprints? Do you think we could like test people? <laughs> Next one's you. The, the bottom of that card. <laughs> <laughs> it says, of the museum ships you visited, which do you think has the most to explore? Uh, is there a particular book you'd recommend for a comprehensive naval history of the USA? Um, in the latter question, comprehensive naval history of the USA, I would struggle actually for that because of the. You've got some really nice books about the American Civil War era Navy. You've got plenty of books about nice books about the kind of pre-dreadnought, dreadnought era US Navy. Um, there's not a huge, as I was reflecting earlier today, there's not a huge amount about the Continental Navy. Um, there's obviously a bit, fair bit about the War of 1812, but there's lots of gaps in the 19th century. An awful lot of books focus on one or more of those periods. But you know, the bit between 1812 and the American Civil War, where you've got you know, the only time the US has ships of the line, there's like one book that I found <laughs> that really covers that period in any great detail, and it just covers that period. <laughs> so comprehensive naval history of the USA, I think I'd struggle to recommend a single volume. I could probably recommend two or three that would take you from beginning to current. Um, but yeah, I don't think I can think of a single long, like full term one. Uh, I can think of like some coffee table books, but those aren't exactly yeah. scholarly. It's, it's more like entry level yeah. um, but of the museum ships you visited which has the most to explore New Jersey obviously <laughs> Ryan but, <laughs> but when, when I was emailing Ryan he, 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 one of the first qu emails that came back was just like where would you like to go this time <laughs> and I was sitting there going where didn't I go last time <laughs> um, yeah this time as I was basically like top of as some of you will know I have vertigo um, this time I possibly stupidly challenged myself by telling Ryan I'd like to go to the highest point you can get on the ship, which is where the radar goes spin, um, and also to conquer the funnel that I wasn't able to do last time because I got vertigo there. The funnel was easy, relatively speaking. That was pretty quick in and out. I got to the climbing the ladder up to the, um, up to the radar and that was possibly the most terrifying thing I've done for quite a while. And bearing in mind, I go charging around like every other week at home in full plate armor, hacking at people with swords and being hacked at. 
that's nothing compared to that. If you've got vertigo, going up that ladder is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> but we made it. So look out for the video later on. Um, yeah, uh, I think my adrenaline levels for the rest of this trip are pretty much done with after that. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's, there's so much to see here. And obviously a massive thanks to, <laughs> to Libya Ride for letting me run around inside this ship and find G Gregorian chanting spaces in the armor void space. <laughs> Uh, this, this next one, I think uh, we both might need to take a crack okay. at. How do you think the American war plan against the British in the 1930s would have gone? <laughs> <laughs> okay, context. The American developed war plan in case of war against the UK, United Kingdom due to trade. I guess that means trade disputes in the Atlantic. Um, who wants to go first? I don't know. I'll take a little bit. Mm. Now, we deserve home field advantage. <laughs> <laughs> we bat last. <laughs> it wasn't that great of a plan, honestly. Uh, but to put it into context, the United States develops a series of plans for potential wars around the world. So there, there are things that you would expect, like war plan black for Germany or orange for Japan, uh, and then some that are really out there for some, some really minor countries. Uh, including um, England is red, of course, and every single one of the colonies at that time gets its own color code as well. Um, Ireland, it's emerald, uh, although she's not an English colony, but um, like, like talking about small neutral countries, when are we ever going to fight these guys? What, what? Um, but like Canada is crimson, India is ruby, uh, I forget what Australia was, but the, the, each one of these empire possessions uh, has their own color code. But the main plan uh, essentially calls for the United States within like the first month of the war, mobilizing enough amphibious assets to take over Nova Scotia so the United Kingdom does not have a base uh, in North America to operate from. And it, we, we find out very quickly during World War II when we've had years of war in Europe to start preparing ourselves, uh, that we can't mount an offensive operation in the first month of a war or the first several months of a war. Uh, so I, I think the American plan fundamentally fails in its first month objectives and then everything else snowballs down from there. And whether the long-term war uh, turns out differently is something to be debated, but as, as far as the plan goes, it wasn't very good. Uh, I'll pass it off to you. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think a, a, a lot of it is also going to depend on how this war develops because in the 1930s, the vast majority of the U.S. fleet is in the Pacific for obvious reasons. The um, Royal Navy has a presence in the what they call the Far East, the Western Pacific, but is mostly split for the majority of the 1930s between the Atlantic fleet, later the home fleet, and the Mediterranean fleet. So, technically speaking, that puts the Royal Navy in a slightly better position because the Mediterranean fleet just has to sail out the Straits of Gibraltar and they can meet up with the Atlantic fleet and then the bulk of the Royal Navy is in the Atlantic, which is probably the most relevant combat theater. Um, but the US Navy has to get all of its stuff over from the Pacific into the Atlantic, which to be fair, most of the time they're based in kind of San Diego on that southwestern continental United States area. Um, it's not going to be too difficult to get to the Panama Canal relative to, you know, later on when they're at Pearl Harbor. But this is, for those of you who've seen the fleet problems videos, this is actually one of the things the US Navy is worried about and constantly is exercising, you know, can we transit a fleet through the Panama Canal quickly enough before the forces from Europe come over and, and stop us? And can people sabotage that? Um, so, I, I mean, you know, building what, what, on what Ryan said, the British plan for war with America basically consisted of, in the 1930s, of we don't think there'll be a war, so why bother wasting time planning on it? <laughs> um, uh, but such as it, such as it was, it was basically consisted of putting cruiser forces in Canada and in Bermuda and various British possessions in the Caribbean to 
an annoy American trade, especially the coastal trade, which obviously later the U-boats would hit. And the idea of that was pretty much the opening phase of pretty much all British war plans in the 1930s was distant powers, which was use the cruisers to focus enemy attention on their local environment, trying to stop their trade being decimated. And while they're doing that, they're not elsewhere, you know, grabbing bits of the British Empire or, or sailing across the Atlantic, which gives the rest of the Royal Navy time to gather and sort out what it's going to do. Um, honestly, over the course of the 1930s, anything could happen because there's, quite, there's some quite major shifts in power during the 1930s of the two fleets, relatively speaking, because at the beginning of the 1930s, you've got Lexington and Saratoga, which, to be fair, that's a lot better a lineup than Courageous, Glorious, and Furious. But then towards the mid to late, latter part of the 1930s, you get Ark Royal coming online, and the Yorktowns are a little bit further down the line, so carrier-wise, and you've got various battleships going into and out of refit. So at any given point, you could have a case where the US Navy has five battleships in refit, and the Royal Navy only has two, so they have a numerical advantage. But then the year, a year or two down the line, that could have been turned completely on its head, especially as the latter part of the 1930s, once you start to get War Spite and Queen Elizabeth and Renown and Valiant going in for their long-term modernizations, that drops the combat, the surface combat strength of the Royal Navy quite considerably. So it would be really hard to predict, I think, um, with the sole exception, again, for those of you who watch the Fleet Problems videos, that all sorts of fancy weird shenanigans would probably have happened around the Panama Canal, given that at one point there was a US Navy officer who managed to, um, in simulation, blow up an entire battleship by dint of just standing there in civilian clothes while the battleship came through one of the narrow locks, then just walked up one of the lines onto the bow, um, ducked, it, ducked into some cover, changed into a US Navy uniform, but when he came aboard as a civilian, no one had challenged him, changed into US Navy uniform, walked down into the magazines, handed the guy in the magazine a note that said, you're dead. <laughs> um, which, you know, if you'd set off a battleship magazine in the narrowest part of the Panama Canal locks, that would pretty comprehensively have meant the US fleet was stuck. So you could have had that, or you could have had something completely different. Um, but this is, as Ryan said, you know, the, the, on the one side you've got not a particularly brilliant plan, and on the other side you've got not really much of a plan either. So you probably would have had both fleets kind of sitting at each other going, okay, now what? <laughs> 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 Question mark? <laughs> um, is the one thing that mm. fall up for that mm. is if they did fight a war, and mm -hmm. let's say it was a significant war, it wasn't just a, a few ships yeah, yeah. shot at each other, then if you had uh, some anonymity coming out of that, mm. And then the U.S. not looking to support the U.K. when World War II started. Yeah. It does, and, you know, it could have had a lot of negative Yeah, that. it could. Yeah, I mean, it, the thing is, it can go either way. Because, yeah, on the one hand, having, yeah, uh, a having the U.S. more hostile to Britain is bad. On the other hand, if both sides have had their fleet shot out from under them in the early 1930s, that means they're going to be rearming with all modern capital <laughs> ships, which is going to be a problem for everybody else. Um, the, I think the, o the only thing that I would throw into that mix is there was one particular admiral in the Royal Navy who, if he was in charge, and he may very possibly well have been because he spent most of the mid to latter part of the 1930s in charge of the Mediterranean fleet. If he'd been in charge, just purely on the basis of him being in charge, I would give the Royal Navy a really big tactical advantage if it came to a fleet engagement, and that is Admiral William Wordsworth Fisher, no relation to Jackie Fisher. Uh, he unfortunately dies of a heart attack in, I think, 1937 or 1938, which is a real pity because if he'd been in charge of the Royal Navy as first sea lord during World War II, I think things would have gone very differently. Um, he was a master of night fighting with capital ship fleets to the extent that Admiral Cunningham in his autobiography specifically credits every nighttime success that he had, including Cape Matapan, to learning from Fisher. And to give you some idea of just how good Fisher was, so obviously we've heard of Admiral Lee's fantastic accomplishment with Washington versus Kirishima, opening fire at 9,000 yards. In a 1935 fleet exercise between the Mediterranean and Atlantic fleets, Admiral Fisher managed to drop the entire Mediterranean fleet at 7,000 yards in battle line formation next to the Atlantic fleet in the middle of the night before they noticed. He was scarily good. Um, I, I, I have a feeling some kind of supernatural power took him from the Royal Navy because otherwise it would not have been a very long naval war of World War II. Um, so 
Uh, it's too dangerous. He cannot. Yeah, pretty much. Did he hand a note or send a signal? You're dead. You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, this was, the, this was the other funny thing. At that, that point, the Royal Navy had a slightly more terrifying form of tra uh, training, which um, I've mentioned in the Guadalcanal campaign series, because the U.S. Navy adopted it, which is offset firing training. So you aim your guns at your target, and you go, right, I have calculated the range and bearing, and then you deliberately offset it by a couple of thousand yards. So you have better hope that you know, the initial aim is good, otherwise he could hit you by accident. And then you just fire full salvos at them. And then you just go, right, well, we, we know, let's say our, our offset is 2,000 yards aft and 3,000 yards over. You fired the salvo, and if the salvo is only, say, 2,000 yards aft and 2,000 yards over, then you know that your first salvo would have actually been ahead and short. Um, and that, that's why they do a several thousand yard offset, because if you're off by a couple of hundred yards, you might actually hit the target. But yeah, you can imagine the look on the faces of the guys in Atlantic Fleet, in the UK Atlantic Fleet, when they were just merrily sailing along, heading towards the Iberian Peninsula in the middle of the night, and then they just look out and seven battleships open fire from basically spitball distance. Um, it was quite, and Admiral Cunningham relates the whole thing because he was playing distraction with his cruisers and destroyers aft by firing star shells at them. So they were, they were looking at the shiny thing that was following them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one we're going to both do. If the Bureau of Ordnance and Bureau of Ships were on the same page about the turret size that they needed for the 16 inch 50 Mark IIs, um, how would that have affected the design of the Iowas? Okay. Well, the, the Mark II guns, which were the ones that were built for the Lexingtons and the 1920 South Dakotas, were fairly heavy. Um, so the Iowas would have come in a somewhat, well, more overweight than their um, trial displacement actually was. The gun performance is similar to the 16-inch 50 Mark 7s, but they also would have had a shorter lifespan because the metallurgy in uh, the early 1920s was not the same as it was in the 1940s. And partly that metallurgy meant that the Mark 7s, when they were built, could be considerably lighter and considerably smaller. Um, and I think that's the other thing. The Mark 7s, had, which are the guns that are on here now, they had to be made light, not just lighter, but also physically, dimensionally smaller around the breech so they could fit within the turret, which could then fit in the barbette. If they'd been on the same page and they know what the actual physical dimensions of the Mark II guns are, then the barbette diameter would have had to have been larger, the turret would have had to have been larger, um, the turret weight would have therefore, and barbette weight would have been greater, which probably would have actually, I think, negatively affected the ship's longevity because there would have been much less reserve stability and reserve buoyancy for later upgrades. <laughs> It would, it would have been, been a few thousand, thousand tons. tons. Yeah, not too much. I don't think it would be too much weight, and it's worth pointing out. I've never seen a plan for the ships uh, where, where it strictly adheres to the 45,000 ton rule. Um, so the ships do have a reserve of buoyancy to include this, but assuming this all happens while, while the ships are still trying to adhere to 45,000 tons, what would be changed? Um, I think the major addition that was added when the weight restriction was removed is the armor that extends the citadel around the refrigerators from turret three all the way to the armored box that the, uh, that the steering gear is in. So that gives the ships more reserve of buoyancy, um, but it's not in the original plan. So I think if they had this extra weight, that armor would have been left off, which means Again, less reserve of buoyancy. Potentially, the ships are, are more uh, susceptible to flooding damage. However, none of the Iowas ever get into any sort of serious flooding situation. So, uh, Jack does have a really good point that the reason these ships keep getting brought back is because they have a massive reserve of buoyancy, so you can keep adding new stuff. And if you've already eaten into that reserve of buoyancy, they're nowhere near as usable. Uh, we are just about out of time here. The uh, Cub Scouts are going to be on their tours in a second. They're already out. You can hear them. Oh, God. <laughs> so this is where we sound abandoned ship, women and curators first. 